for inviting me to um, speak to the, to the meeting today. And it's been fascinating to see the, the talks this morning and see the really um, positive habitat management work going on, which of course is, is, is so much needed for, for moths as much as anything else. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, moth recording in um, the, well, the Teavert region. I'm actually county moth recorder for Berkshire. Um, Berkshire, in this case, referring to the Vice County, so it runs all the way up to Whiteham Woods on the edge of Oxford. Um, and moth recording has been happening in Berkshire for a very long time. And if you go all the way back to the Victoria County history that was published in 1906, there were already over 1,200 species known from the county. And my predecessor as county recorder, the, the late Brian Baker, published his um, book on the county's moths and butterflies in 1994. Uh, and that was the first sort of real update since the 1906 list. And um, a number of several hundred species were added to the list in that book. So um, Brian passed on the county recorder role to me back in 1995, at which point I was living in Berkshire. I haven't actually lived in Berkshire since the early 2000s. I'm now in Buckinghamshire, um, but these things all balance out because the Buckinghamshire county moth recorder, Martin Albertini, lives in Berkshire. So between us, we uh, seem to <laughs> occasionally we, we pass in the night, as it were. So what goes on in Berkshire? Well, an awful lot of recording goes on in Berkshire. Uh, moth recording is something that um, has become more popular in recent years and it is also something that can generate an awful lot of records and unfortunately those 19th century moth recorders were just not very good at computerizing their records so we've still definitely got some gaps um, in the older data which has uh, never managed to be sort of caught up with and digitized um, but since about 2015, we've been getting at least 60,000 records a year, which is as many as we were getting for the whole decade back in the 1980s and 1990s. And 2020 was an extraordinary year, and I suspect that must have been somewhat influenced by the lockdown situation and the fact that um, perhaps more people were spending more time at home running their moth traps more often than they might have done otherwise. Um, and I think the 2021 total will move up further. There's still a lot of records coming through for 2021 at the moment. And there's always quite a lot of backlog of records that I haven't yet got around to dealing with and bringing into the system. So it does take time for these things to come through. Um, but I've only just realised that um, we've now gone over a million records for moths in the Berkshire data set. Um, so as I say, it is a lot of data. And where does it come from? On the face of it, the coverage is actually pretty good across the county. There are some pretty big white gaps in West Berkshire where there are fewer people living and uh, less opportunity to get out with moth traps quite so easily. Um, and in some areas, less um, availability of good habitats, I suppose, as well. But across the county as a whole, as I say, it does look pretty good. That picture changes slightly if you look at the numbers of species per square across the county. And all the yellow squares here have fewer than 20 moth species recorded. And for anyone who's familiar with moth recording, if you run a moth trap in the middle of summer, you would expect to be getting up towards 100 species without too much effort. So all those yellow squares are still pretty under recorded for moths, really. Um, so despite the fact that we have lots of people doing lots of fantastic recording, I think it does underline the challenge of moth recording that um, you do need to put quite a lot of effort to get out there and run traps overnight and um, get access to sites and to go out at different times of year to build up the species lists. So there's certainly plenty of scope for finding out more things about Berkshire's moths and new discoveries are being made all the time. The green line on this chart shows, based on the records in the database, um, shows how species have been added to the county list over the years. And as you can see, it continues to rise. Um, and we are now over 1600 species altogether in the county and new species are still being added to the county list every year. But we, some species, of course, have not been seen for a long time now and appear to have been lost from the county list. And the orange line here is the sort of balance of species that are left if you take away the ones that were last seen in each of those years. So although we are gaining species, we are also losing them. And there are 136 species that have so far not been recorded this century that have, do have records from earlier time periods. 
But as I say, the, the total numbers of species are continuing to increase. Um, I don't think we had any new macro moth species in 2021, but we did have a few new micro moths added to the list. And among the species that are lost, there are some ones that are really very sadly missed. Um, the orange moth, which is a wonderfully straightforward moth name, that one, isn't it? You've got a, a, a moth here that's big and bright and orange, and we'll just call it the orange moth. So that, that's a good name. Last recorded in Berkshire in 1997, um, and that one would be fantastic to see again, but it doesn't seem to be gone. And nationally, it's undergone a decline of 77% since 1990. So this is a species that's really struggling. And I must admit, I don't really know why it's struggling. It's, it's um, not confined to any particularly rare food plant or anything. Um, so the assumption is there might be something going on with the climate or with pollution perhaps that might be impacting it. Um, our preferred route for records coming into the system is for them to come via iRecord uh, and on the iRecord website there is a specific moth recording form that you can use and the iRecord app also feeds into that. And as of this year, the National Moth Recording Scheme that Butterfly Conservation look after also have their own online system which links in to iRecord. So that's also um, perfectly good for, for putting moth records into the Berkshire data set. But if you are using other systems or have records in spreadsheets, um, then please do pass those on to us as well. That they don't have to come through iRecord if you're not a user of that system. Um, but it does make it much easier to, to get the data flowing if we do get them into that system. We also share records via the National Biodiversity Network. We're very keen that the records are out there and able to be used. Um, but at the moment, it's mostly the more recent records that, that get onto there. There are some um, issues around sharing the older ones, which we haven't quite managed to tackle yet. But at this point, I want to um, give you a preview of something that I'm very excited about and which I think will allow other people to get a much better idea of what's going on with moth recording in the area. And in the not too distant future, I'm hoping within a matter of months uh, at the most, we should see the launch of the Upper Thames Moths Atlas website. And uh, this has been set up by a chap called Jim Wheeler, who's actually based in Norfolk and is, um, I, I think he's Norfolk County Moth Recorder. He's certainly a very keen mother in Norfolk. He's the county recorder there. And he has set up similar websites for a number of counties across the country now. And we're very grateful to Upper Thames Branch of Butterfly Conservation for funding the setup costs for getting this website up and running. And what this will do is it will cover all three of the Upper Thames counties, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, and it will show all the records. It's not a live system. They don't update as new records come in. And at the moment, Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire run up to 2020. Berkshire, I'm afraid, is a year behind at the moment. We've only got our records up to 20. 2019 on, on this new platform but it is very impressive the amount of information it contains so this is probably the commonest or most frequently recorded moth across the three counties the large yellow underwing and this is the species account page that um, you'll be able to go to and you can focus in on the map and see the distribution across the three counties there's some really nicely displayed flight period charts with the green bars for the adults and the black bars for the early stages and the number the three lines are on the line chart there the green in the middle and the number of records the black at the top are the number of individual counted moths and the blue are the number of sites that are recorded each year for large yellow underwing there's a species account for all these species and here I must acknowledge the input of Martin Townsend who's the county moth recorder for Oxfordshire and Martin has put in an enormous amount of effort to bring the, the um, information up to date for all these species accounts um, for every species across the counties um, and I'm very grateful for his input there. The other person who's put in an enormous amount of work is Dave Wilton who's been coordinating the photos and there should be photos for nearly all the species when the website launches but we will also be asking people to contribute extra photos and it will be possible for people to upload a photo onto the site and we'll be able to run that through and add to the resource there but this is not a recording site your records still need to go onto iRecord or direct to the county recorders in the three counties you can't add them directly to this website 
looking at a bit of a Berkshire speciality, the heart moth, which is very much found in Windsor Forest and hardly anywhere else. Um, and it's a, a real conservation priority for the county. And anybody will be able to go to the website and see that basic information about it. You can see further detail, but for this, we do ask you to subscribe to the website and it's not not yet decided exactly what that it'll be as a, a low amount as we can make it. Um, but there are running costs with keeping the website going every year. And we are hoping that enough people will choose to subscribe just to allow us to keep the site going. And if you do that, you get access to some more detailed maps and indeed to a summary of the individual records that appear on those maps and some more detailed charts um, as well. So you do get some extra information if you choose to subscribe. But lots of the information will be available to anybody visiting the site, including something else I'm really excited about, which has our own Upper Thames Flying Tonight display. And this sort of way of looking at moth records has been set up for a number of other counties, but it's the first time we've, we've had it tailored for the Upper Thames region. And um, what this will show you, if you go to it on any given day, it will show you the moths that are most likely to be seen on that day, plus or minus four days. Um, and at the top of the list here are the species that have the greatest number of records at that date. So it's a really, really useful thing if you're trying to identify the moths that you've seen in your moth trap or just out and about. Um, the, there's a very good chance that they'll be towards the top of this list, but you can also scroll down and see what are the more unusual species that have been found at any given time of year. So I'm really excited by this. I'm really grateful to my colleagues who put so much work into this and to, to Upper Thames Branch for supporting it. And we hope to be able to let you into this live in the very near future. Moving on to some species updates, um, I wanted to pick out a, a, a few of the many um, uh, highlights and interesting things that have happened um, in 2021. And this is a species new to Berkshire that David Hassel found in Chapel Row in July. It's one of the micromoth species, and it's quite a rarity, first found in the UK in 1994. And it does now seem to have become established as a breeding uh, resident um, in the southeast, particularly near the coast. But this is the first time it's been seen in Berkshire. It feeds on garlic mustard and hedge mustard, and I think there's every chance that it could become established in the future. So we'll be looking out for this one again. A rather more exotic visitor turned up um, in Windsor where David Short um, grabbed a quick photo of this rather tiny little moth, um, which we eventually managed to work out was um, an American species in genus Sufatula. Um, we don't know for absolute certain what the species is, but it's probably the one named there, Diminutalis, um, which although its native range is in America, it has been imported into Europe a few times. But this is not only new to Berkshire, but it's new to the UK. Um, and it's not particularly positive news, I guess, from a conservation point of view. It's entirely a non-native species with caterpillars feeding on the roots of palms. Um, so it's uh, certainly not going to be of any conservation significance, um, but hopefully it's not going to become um, too much of a pest either. And it's always interesting to see these odd things when they turn up. The next bit of news is much sadder. And um, this is Douglas Boys, who I expect some of you will know or will have encountered. And um, Douglas sadly passed away in towards the end of 2021. Um, Douglas was one of my colleagues researching at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and had um, been doing some absolutely amazing research into moths. In particular, one of the things that Doug had specialised in was looking at the effects of light pollution, not just on adult moths, but also on their early stages. And he was an absolutely enthusiastic and expert recorder himself. Um, did lots of recording in the county, took a particular interest in white and woods, and his record here of the Olive Crescent was only the third county record and the first for white and woods. And um, this is a, a really sad loss to moth recording, um, but obviously also a really sad occasion for, for Douglas's many friends and relatives. Butterfly Conservation are running a um, uh, an online um, sort of donation to build up a fund in memory of Douglas that will be used to encourage young people to get involved in moth recording in the future. Um, so um, that's that's worth looking out for there. So some very sad news there. Moving on to um, pick up some few 
a few of the other records from 2021 and partly just to prove that I do occasionally manage to get back into Berkshire. Um, Steve Wheatley and Peter Cuss um, kindly arranged a recording visit to Swinley Brick Pits. Swinley is a site between Bracknell and Ascot over in the east of the county uh, and we've known for quite a long time that it has some really interesting moths there. The target on this occasion was a moth called the Silvery Arches, which had not been recorded in Berkshire since 2013. And last June, um, Mark Botham, myself and Steve and Peter um, went to Swinley Brick Pits to see if we could find this moth. And I'm very pleased to report that we did. I say we, it turned up in Peter's traps and it turned up in Steve's traps and it managed to completely avoid all of my moth traps. Um, but nonetheless, it was really, really pleasing to see that the moth was still there and there were plenty of other interesting moths to see at the same time. And Swinley Brick Pits does seem to be turning out to be a really top class site for moths in Berkshire. Um, and in the following month, um, Dave Carter and Derek Barker have been continuing to monitor the moths on the site. Uh, and in July last year, Dave Carter, uh, well, I think it was both Dave and David were, were, were there and recorded the Dark Tussock, which was the first Berkshire record since 2003. And then even more astoundingly, um, they've managed to find the Anomalous, which is a fantastic name for a moth. And it's a moth that had not been recorded in Berkshire since the 19th century. And here it is back in its typical heathland habitat at Swinley Brick Pits. Um, so this is really amazingly good news for Berkshire moths. Um, but I think it also highlights the vulnerabil vulnerability of some of these species. They are now only known from one site in Berkshire, which is a lot better than none but it is a site in a part of the county that is under a lot of pressure from housing and other development. Uh, and we really hope that uh, we can retain the wonderful species that are known from this site. I want to move on to look at um, some of our largest and most spectacular moths. Uh, and these are species in the genus Catacala, of which the most widely seen is the red underwing. And uh, this is a species usually seen in late summer, and it's a big spectacular moth with these fantastic red underwings shown really well in Suzanne Parrott's photo here. And red underwing is a moth that is reasonably um, widespread in Berkshire. Its range in the northern part of the, the country has been expanding in recent years, so it seems to be doing reasonably well. And in Berkshire, the, the distribution seems to be at least stable, if not increasing. So, um, so that's a, a lovely moth to see, and you do stand a good chance of finding that one. Until quite recently, you stood almost no chance at all of finding the related species of blue underwing, also known as the Clifton nonpareil. And the only record that we were we had in Berkshire for a long time was from 1998, um, when Steve Nash found it, um, and that was almost certainly a migratory individual that just turned up by chance. Uh, and I would have thought your chances of finding it again in Berkshire were really quite low. But in 2013, Graham Dennis found it right down near the Hampshire border. In 2014, turned up again in the woodlands just near Oxford. And then in 2015, something really amazing started to happen. There were a whole lot of records popped up in that year. And this is a moth that feeds, well, the, the red underwing we just looked at feeds on willows and poplars um, on quite a range of those species. The blue underwing is always believed to be principally a, a species that feeds on aspen. But with its spread, it does seem to be looking the way that it might be picking off on some of the other poplar species as well as aspen. And in the years since 2015, the spread has continued and you are now getting to the point where you could quite likely find a blue underwing in your, if you were to run a moth trap towards the end of summer in Berkshire. And this is an enormous, spectacular, beautiful moth with those vivid bright blue lines. So it's really been amazing to see this spread across the county. A couple of um, lovely photos here. John Cole's photo showing the amazing underside patterns for the moth and that lovely blue strip on the hind wings um, on the, the top surface. Needless to say, it's another species that hasn't yet found its way into one of my moth traps, but I'm delighted to see so many other people enjoying seeing it. There are two other species related to the red underwing, um, which I would also have thought were very unlikely to do well in Berkshire, 
but the dark crimson underwing does now seem to be um, a regular in the county, first recorded in 2004 and then since 2019 it's been seen annually. And the even rarer, oh there it is, the dark crimson underwing um, with its beautiful red hind wings again, quite similar to the red underwing but a few subtle differences. And the even rarer light crimson underwing, we had one record from 1898 um, in Tubney Woods, I think that was. Um, nothing at all since then until 2020 and again in 2021. And this one seems to be following along with its relatives and spreading its way out. And it's another big, beautiful moth. What this does mean is, is that if you now find a so-called red underwing in Berkshire, you've got to look at it really, really closely and work out whether it really is the red underwing or whether it's one of the two crimson underwing species. And looking at the hind wings is a really helpful um, part of taking them apart. And uh, they're not always very obliging at showing you their hind wings, um, but that's the ideal way to look at them. And there are some subtle differences on the, the, the fore wings as well. So it's been brilliant to see these species coming into the county and spreading out. Um, I guess it probably is climate change behind it again. So it does raise all those questions about the problems of climate change and the changes to our environment. But just on the basis of seeing some fantastic moths, it's a really nice thing. So moth recording in the county um, as I say, I don't get back to the county very much myself, um, but I do work very closely with my colleagues in the Berkshire Moth Group. And I'm particularly grateful to Mark Corway and Graham Hawker, who take the lead in, in running this group. And we have regular meetings that have been online for some time now, of course. Um, and with the help of Peter Cuss, um, a field meeting program is put together. Peter's been really good at um, coming up with some targeted approaches to looking for some of the rarer species. The Berkshire Moth Group also has a very active Facebook page where you can get lots of help for identification and um, just keep up with what's going on. Lots of resources on the Berkshire Moth Group website, including a fantastic set of reports that Les Finch and Martin Finch have been producing for a number of years now. Um, one of their series of reports focuses on their local patch in Maidenhead and they've got some absolutely brilliant analysis of all the, the records that um, they've been getting from their very extensive set of uh, moth trapping, uh, mostly in, in gardens in Maidenhead. So do look at the website to find out about those. Um, the website is also, also the place where we announce other bits and pieces of news and shortly another piece of news um, that I'm very excited about. A few years ago, um, the Berkshire Moth Group under the leadership of Nick Asher produced a book, The Common Micromoths of Berkshire, which is an amazingly helpful identification guide to the species of micromoth that you're most likely to see. It's rapidly sold out and has been out of print for a while. It is available to download from the website as a PDF. But very shortly, again, um, later in, in the summer, about June, we hope, um, there will be a completely revised second edition of this book coming. And it's, this will be a printed hard copy that will be available to buy. And Nick has done a fantastic job of completely revising this and more or less doubling the number of species included and the number of photos included. And the way it's laid out to show you the features you need to look at to identify the species is, is really, really well done. So um, as I say, that's another thing I'm very much looking forward to this year. And that brings me to the end of the talk, really. And I just want to stress, um, as with any recording scheme, this really is a team effort. Lots and lots of people are involved in sending the records in and helping with the identifications and checking things and running the websites. And I particularly want to mention John Thacker at this point, who is uh, the main person who helps me with the verification of the records coming through iRecord. And um, um, he, he's provided an enormous amount of support, particularly with the records that have photos uh, and the checking as they come in. Uh, but of course, thank you to everybody who has ever sent in a record. Every single record does make a difference. It all adds to our knowledge of moths. And I would encourage you if, you, if you do have records out there that aren't in the system yet, please do send them in. Please do bear with us uh, with the backlog and the time that it can take to deal with all these records. But we are doing our best to get them out there. And with the new Upper Thames Atlas website coming along, um, it'll be much easier for you to see um, how all the records are adding up and to see how they fit into that wider picture. 
So I will leave it there and thanks very much for the opportunity to speak and I'm really looking forward to the next talk after the interval, um, which will tell us a little bit more about um, some of the moth species in Berkshire. Thank you for that, Martin. Really good presentation and good update on a whole, whole range of issues. Um, got a few questions come through. Um, so thinking about the crimson underwings, um, what do you think, why do you think they've sort of reappeared after a hundred years of no records? Um, I must admit, I haven't done an awful lot of research into this myself. Um, the, the, the crimson underwings have been resident, and indeed the, the blue underwing, I think, but certainly the crimson underwings were always resident further south, and a lot of people used to go to the New Forest as the place to go and see the crimson underwings. Mm -hmm. uh, and there they were, they, they're actually, I forgot to say actually, they are oak feeders, the two crimson species, and in, in the New mm -hmm. Forest they were associated with these really ancient oak trees. Um, they don't the adult moths don't feed at flowers but they're very fond of feeding on sap runs on the ancient trees mm -hmm. and that did seem to be what they really liked but they seem to be being found in a wide some of them they, they are being found at Windsor Forest which has some equally ancient oak trees and they do now seem to be turning up in a few other places and I'm sure that's partly to do with climate change and sometimes with some insects we find that where the climate has changed it not only allows them to spread because the temperature has changed it sometimes has an effect on their sort of ecology and allows them to move into habitats that previously would have been considered suboptimal. Mm. but with that slight sort of warming and change in the in the sort of climatic conditions it allows some species to spread into habitats that they previously wouldn't have been able to survive in and i've got no idea whether that really is what's happening with the crimson underwings but it could be something like that that's leading to the, the spread we're seeing okay thank you um brian clues was interested with these rising energy costs we've got at the moment do you think that's going to affect the scale of trapping over the years ahead that's an interesting question <laughs> Um, possibly, um, yep, yeah, so I, I, there, there are various ways of powering uh, moth traps. You can run battery traps and you could have a battery that charges by solar power and get your battery charged up that way. There are some people experimenting with using LED lights on moth traps, which have far lower power requirements. Um, but yeah, people running traps in their gardens often run it off the mains and people going out in the countryside often need to have generators that are run from petrol um, and costs, I guess, will be increasing. Uh, and um, they don't get through a huge amount of petrol um, doing this sort of thing. So um, hopefully it will still be manageable for, for, for people. But yeah, it, it is it is going to be another little sort of issue to, to um, possibly get in the way of a few things. But you can go out and look for day flying moths. You can go out and look for caterpillars. You can go out and do wine roping and sugaring. There's all sorts of ways of finding and getting interested in moths that don't involve having to run sort of big light traps. Good, thank you. Uh, Ruth Ashcroft was asking, um, from the data that you're getting, is that allowing you to get measures of general moth abundance? Moth abundance is, is a really hard thing to, to measure, actually, and we many people do count the moths that come into their moth traps, but it's really hard to know how that relates to the actual population abundance that is out there. Mm. And really, um, the, the, the sort of mothing that most of us do is really, really good at picking up on changes in distribution and just finding out where moths live and what habitats they might be using. But to get a really good handle on abundance, we probably need to use other methods. And one of the principal ways of doing that is through the Rothamsted um, light trap network. Yeah which runs across the whole country and does have some some traps in Berkshire and that's a much more systematic trapping system um, and I think one of the people who's in the audience today is one of the one of the people who runs one of the Berkshire Rothamsted moth traps Ian Sims I think I saw his name earlier pop up <laughs> and Ian and the other people who get involved with that do fantastic work running those light traps every night and actually getting systematic data on the numbers that come into the traps. And the Rothamsted Research Institute takes all that data and, and does analyse that and that feeds into the figures that you'll see quoted for national declines and changes in moths. So I think we need a mixture of approaches to, to, to look at some of the questions around the, the abundance. And some of my colleagues at Centre for Ecology and Hydrology are involved in some big projects in conjunction with Rothamsted and some other research institutes that are um, 
looking at some of the trying to bring together all these different data sets and get a more a better idea on whether the changes in insect abundance that we hear so many worrying stories about really are properly evidenced and, and what mm. might be causing them thank you um, and then just quickly duncan was wondering does the Berkshire moth group or i guess others have moth trap loaning schemes for new members new members of the public to have a try in their gardens um, those, those schemes certainly do exist. I can't remember whether we've got that within. I'm sure some somebody else on the call will be able to to remind me whether the Berkshire Moth Group has traps available at the moment, and possibly Upper Thames Branch Butterfly Conservation may do. Um, it's not something I actually I can't quite remember who has them and how it works, but it may well be a possibility. So yeah, do get in touch with us if you're interested, and um, yeah, we'll see what we can do. Great.